Wimbledon hope Tim Henman talks about the pressure on him to win in this week's Radio Times, which also includes complete listings for all television and major satellite channels. Defence and prosecution sum up their cases and the jury must decide. Be there for the final outcome in 45 minutes. First on BBC Two, Newsnight. Not since Oscar and Felix has there been such an odd couple. But are Tory MPs prepared to bless this extraordinary union? Good evening. An arranged marriage or a deranged marriage? Cynical Tories describe it as an instability pact and a marriage made in hell. Today's coupling is one of the strangest in political history. But will it deliver Ken Clark, the leadership of the Conservative Party, and John Redwood in return for his handsome diary, the shadow chancellorship? We speak to two Redwoodites who are gutted by this partnership. But Norman Tebbit is giving the union his blessing. In his first interview of the leadership contest, I'll ask him why he and Lady Thatcher seemed finally to have parted political company. I am supporting William Hay. Now, have you got the name? <laughs> William Hay. <laughs> Vote for William Hay. Also from America, a special report on the chemicals with a feminizing effect. Something's happening to the world's males. Wildlife, like these terns on Bird Island in Massachusetts, is turning female. Our own fertility, too, may be under attack. Three chemicals in everyday use are under suspicion. Still largely a puzzle to scientists, this is a threat to humankind many believe could rival any of the great environmental challenges like global warming. And here we'll be hearing grave worries from the home counties about cash shortages and health and education. Can Gordon Brown afford to hold to the no new spending line? First, the staggering partnership forged between Kenneth Clark and John Redwood may have taken everyone's breath away but tonight there's still a great deal of life in the Hague camp. It's all to play for in tomorrow's third ballot. And Lady Thatcher has been doing her best for her man, handbagging right-wing MPs all round the corridors of Westminster. Our political correspondent, Mark Mardell, has been watching the blossoming of this fine romance. <laughs> Remember that series, The Odd Couple, the prissy and precise Oscar and beer-swilling cigar-chomping Felix try to set up house together? I was only asking. No, I'm going to hang around the house, have a couple of beers, I'm going to turn in early, I'm tired. That's for me. Today, there are predictions another attempt at peaceful cohabitation could descend into fractious farce. This odd couple are pretty odd. Opponents have spent the day deriding the unlikely alliance as a new Hitler-Stalin pact, an unworkable marriage made in hell, even, this from a former cabinet minister, an unnatural act. The two men who represent the extremes of conservative opinion over Europe joining forces. Future leader of the Conservative Party, ladies and gentlemen. In the leadership election campaign, I made it very clear that we needed to bring an end to the civil war in the Conservative Party. I said we needed to stop the balkanization of the party with little groups and little cells in little corners and little rooms arguing through the media with each other. Certainly I can say of John that I respect his integrity, I respect the courage of his convictions which he has frequently displayed in his career, and obviously I respect his intellect and his political ability and the other things he's contributed to the Conservative cause over the years. That's a bit of a change of tune from when John Redwood first challenged for the leadership. Mr. Clark then said, I don't think the Conservative Party could win an election in a thousand years on this ultra-right-wing programme. Similarly, two years later, Mr. Redwood derided Mr. Clark's style, saying, the Conservative Party does not have to camp out on the middle ground, averaging out what the extremes want. They didn't agree on the meaning of loyalty either. Mr. Clark told the party in 1993, any enemy of John Major's is an enemy of mine. In 1995, John Redwood said of Mr. Major, no change, no chance. Do this odd couple really have a chance themselves? 
Well, I, I think there was a certain discomfort among some uh, people there this morning, in all, all frankness. But nevertheless, many of us, it's a sort of cavalier brigade, if you like, get on rather well together personally. The important point to make here is that in opposition, we don't call the shots. The Labour government will take the vital decisions on Europe and on the, the single currency. If we have to have a free vote in opposition on that, then let's have it, let's forget about it, let's get on with devising the policies to win the next election. One academic argues the very desire to rediscover common ground could unite the party. One of the arts of leadership is to choose the issues on which to unite a party. That's what John Major was catastrophically bad at. It was almost like the Tory party had a sort of death wish about always harking on the one issue that divided them, rather than uniting around issues uh, that on the whole they were in agreement about. Now, effective leadership um, is about shifting the issues. By tomorrow night, this alliance will either look like an act of desperation or a flash of brilliance. After all, politics is all about unlikely, powerful alliances. And at least one former Hague supporter is now going over to what he regards as the unity team. But many Eurosceptics are, well, sceptical. One former Redwood supporter said, I'd never have backed him if I knew he'd end up with the enemy. Another predicted it would end in a shambles. Another on the right gleefully claimed it would mean perpetual war. I think superficially it is attractive, but it does not address the depth or breadth of the issues of the tension uh, within the Conservative Party. Uh, it seems to me to be an attempt at superficial levels to reconcile um, what was previously regarded as incompatible. Uh, I like the initiative, I support the initiative, but I doubt it really has the substance. But some were tempted by the odd couple, so the hate camp counter-attacked with their secret weapon. I am supporting William Hay. Now, have you got the name? <laughs> William Hay. Vote for William Hay for principal government following the same kind of government which I led and vote for him on Thursday. Got the message. There are a lot of Thank you. Yeah. Lady Thatcher today phoned back benches with what one described as a forthright message that Ken Clark was unsound on Europe, helped lose the last election, and that under him the dissent would continue. I came out firmly for William because of the principles that he was founding his vision upon. They're very much the principles which I used to govern and founded the, my government on those principles for quite a long time. How many will listen? 38 Tory MPs voted for John Redwood yesterday. Presuming his vote stays steady, Ken Clark needs another 19 to win. William Hague needs 21 to come top. 12 former Redwoodites are told Newsnight they're switching to Clark, and 12 have said they'll go for Hague, with 14 undecided or not saying there's everything to play for. You won. Make a decision already. What's the big deal? Here we go. But what would the odd couple serve up if the decision went their way? Is there more to it than a marriage of convenience? Not really on Europe. John Redwood can still say he's against a single currency on principle. They're both against what's on offer at the moment. If things change, the Shadow Cabinet would try to reach a consensus. If not, there'd be a free vote. It's a hypothetical situation of considerable uncertainty. And neither John nor I could see the slightest point of beating the Conservative Party on the anvil further on that issue. There is an understanding between Clark and Redwood uh, on, on monetary union. But of course there's the wider issue of the repatriation of powers, the renegotiation of treaties and so on. Uh, and this does not seem to be been addressed. Now I fear very much that, uh, that the marriage that is about to, be, about to take place uh, could well soon face very serious tensions. William Hague's team were left on the back foot today by one of the most bizarre alliances in recent political history. The Conservatives' future hangs on just a handful of votes. If there's a dead heat, there'd have to be yet another ballot. Mark Mardell. Well, I'm joined now from Westminster by two former Redwood men who've made it clear they're not prepared to follow their leader, Desmond Swain and John Townend. Desmond Swain, could you ever have dreamt up such a duel? I suppose I could have dreamt of it. Um, probably in a nightmare. Uh, John Townend, how do you think uh, John Redwood comes out of all this? Well, I must say, I think it's all rather bizarre. The thought of Eurosceptics voting for a leader of the Conservative Party who is a bigger Europhile than Tony Blair is, I think, very strange. But you spent last night trying to persuade John Redwood not to enter this marriage. What was his justification when he refused to listen to you? Well, I don't think I can disclose what the discussions were 
actually private discussions. Uh, I just pointed out that uh, the, the reservations I had, the fact that I felt that uh, if uh, the economic conditions for monetary union came good in the next four years and Tony Blair tried to take us in, we then need a party that was led by a man who could oppose it on a matter of principle rather than on economic grounds because the economic grounds criteria would be okay. I also pointed out that uh, Kenneth Clark was the most left wing of any of our cabinet ministers and this would be handing uh, over control of the party machine to the left wing of the party. And for people like me, we've been fighting our left wing in the party for years. Desmond Swain, do you think the demeanour of the party would change in that regard? I think it's inevitable. Uh, the leader of the party, especially uh, at a time when the party is going to be reformed, and I think it's undoubtedly the case that the leadership will take a greater influence than has hitherto been the, place, the case uh, with respect to candidate selection, imperceptibly but pervasively over a period of uh, months and even years, uh, the whole nature of the party and candidate selection will begin to reflect the leadership. The leadership is the key issue. We are here to choose a leader, not a leader and his lieutenants. Well, John Tyland, you were talking about Europe, but that domestic is probably a long way off. If this uh, duo wins through, will there be earlier domestics? Can you see them cohabiting in harmony? Well, I would hope so, because I think there's a great feeling in the Tory party that we must unite behind whoever is elected. But I'm quite convinced now, having talked to a lot of people who voted for John Redwood in the previous ballot, I'm quite convinced that uh, William Hague will win tomorrow. So I think the question is rather hypothetical. But uh, Desmond, do you think because of the way this has been conducted, especially in the, the last days, there will be a great legacy of bitterness in the party? You can't have one 50% of the party happy alienating the other 50%. I'm a bit sceptical about that. We are, after all, politicians. There is an election on, and I think people have to be mature about that. Deals will be done. Uh, this is not a deal of which I approve, um, and I'm sure it's a deal which... Uh, many people disapprove of, but nevertheless, it's a perfectly legitimate one. And I think that, you know, were the result to go against me tomorrow, I would unite behind it. It's not one that I would choose, though. And is your view the same as John Townend's, that Haig's going to win it? I, I suspect so, yes. But I've been remarkably bad at predicting <laughs> results thus far. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. Well, I'm joined now by the former Conservative Chairman, Lord Tebbit. Lord Tebbit, could you have ever predicted this in a million years? not altogether surprised um, and it's not a new sort of initiative for Ken Clark uh, back when Margaret Thatcher was being brought down by Michael Heseltine um, I think it's possible for me now to say that Ken Clark suggested to me that he and I should run together so he quite um, likes this le right left balance we're in a right left balance and his argument was Norman, we've, we've often disagreed about things, but at the end of the day, we've always found a way of, of working along together. Um, I said no, uh, be, not because I didn't want to work with Ken, uh, but because I, for personal reasons, didn't want to take on the leadership of the Conservative Party. But when you hear uh, Lady Thatcher talk there about the only principled way to go ahead is to have principled leadership, and that is with uh, Mr. Haig, is this a deal, not a solution? as William Haig would have it? Well, I think Mr. Haig probably represents um, a deal of the same sort within himself. Um, I'm a little unclear even now as to how firm he is on a number of issues. And if John Redwood and Ken Clark can get together and find a way of living together, then surely that does bring the whole party together. That's the nub of it, though. Uh, writing about Kenneth Clark's unsuitability to lead, a senior Tory said, to talk now of free votes on European issues seems hollow in the wake of bludgeoning the party into sullen submission over the Maastricht Treaty and is a weak stance from such a robustious controversialist. What do you make of that? Well, William Hague was in the Cabinet um, at that time. And uh, if he and uh, Michael Howard and um, Peter Lilly had gone to the Prime Minister and said, no, we're not going to have this, um, things would have been very different. So I don't see there's a lot to choose over, over that. But you wrote these words at the start of the Tory leadership campaign yes. on the 11th of May. Do you yes. stand by them now? A free vote is just a weasel way out? That is what John Redwood is standing firm for. 
I, I, I don't like the idea. I would prefer it to have been John Redwood winning cleanly. But John wasn't able to do so. The party wasn't prepared to have that. And I think at the end of the day, it's better that we have a balance between these two men um, than anything else. But that's surely for you a very strong point of principle because your feelings about Europe are so strong. This has been left to essentially an unprincipled fudge. Well, lots of things are. Um, you know, you were saying earlier, this is a most extraordinary political marriage. More extraordinary than Blair and Prescott? I mean, surely there could be nothing more extraordinary than that. Um, but it seems to have worked, doesn't it? But when you look back at, you, you talk about, you know, great respect for Kenneth Clark and so forth, but you've name-called each other. He's taught, said that you were conducting a civil war in the Tory party. Right. You've said in the past that perhaps a less pro-European chancellor should be the one uh, to lead the party into the election. You actually yes. called in John Major to dump him. Yes. Is the party not now entirely at sixes and sevens about its direction? Now, the key to all this, as far as I'm concerned with Ken, is that through, throughout it all, we've remained really very civilised friends underneath the certain amount of flack which has gone back and forth in public during the course of an election, because I wanted John Redwood to win. Let's be absolutely clear about that. Um, but I've respected Ken as a very, very astute politician. I've said so many times, but we differ on the great issue, and which is of Europe and the single currency above all. Now, the fact is that we're not going to make the decision about the single currency in the next five years. If that decision is made, it will be by a government with a majority of 175. But isn't it the case that, in a sense, the right now holds Kenneth Clark as their prisoner? Well, that would be a nice idea if it's true. <laughs> um, and uh, therefore, if, if that's correct, the whole thing would be worthwhile. Uh, but Ken's a pretty tough guy to hold as prisoner. I think what's going to happen is that being forced to work together, they will be concentrating on the issues on which and they do agree. Yeah, and you want a big hitter, you, so just yeah, because sure. we haven't much time. Where do you think that they are capable of landing the killer blows on Labour? Very briefly, what would be the first killer blow? Well, of course, on, on the economy, above all, um, where we're seeing already that uh, they're having to um, go back on their word about the National Health Service, about privatisation and things of that, and before very long, the issue on which we are very much united, the constitutional questions. And Ken is sound on that, and so is John Redwood. But who's going to win tomorrow? Can you call it? Oh, no, I think it's going to be very close, because, of course, now um, Clark Redwood um, are saying jointly something which is not that far from what William Hague is saying. The question is the style, the credibility of the two teams. And I think that's going to be pretty close. Well, Taylor, thank you very much indeed. We've all heard about the big environmental threats.